This is uh, session number five on the Ramban and Koheles. As I've mentioned a couple of times before, the, this is really the swan song of Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman to his, to his community in Catalonia before he leaves for Eretz Yisrael. And the choice of drasha, the choice, the, uh, the subject choice of this drasha, and the content of the drasha are very revealing. In that while it is called the Ramban's drasha on the book of Koheles, there are so many other subjects that he touches upon that really help and helping us understand why he touches on these subjects based upon the historical context of why he is giving this drasha and when he is giving this drasha in his life. He's just been ordered to have forced exile. He has to, he's the chief rabbi of all of Catalonia, which is the northeastern uh, sort of province of Spain. He was the chief rabbi for many, many years. Everything was peaceful. He was involved in a disputation. And as a result, the aftermath, despite the fact that he won the disputation, he's forced now to leave. He eventually will make his way to Eretz Yisrael. And so we can certainly understand the Ramban becoming very circumspect and philosophical about the meaning of life, and therefore talking about the book of Kohelis in general. But the last thing that we saw last week in our discussion of uh, what the Ramban chooses to extract from the book of Kohelis is that he says one of the major themes of the book of Kohelis is the subject of theodicy, where, the, where Shlomo HaMelech chooses to try and explain, uh, based upon the observations that he's made in his life, of why bad things happen to good people. And what we saw the last time that we discussed this, the very last thing that we ended with, was that for the Ramban, um, uh, Shlomo HaMelech's book of Koheles does not, get eat, does not get into the deeper reasons for why HaKadosh Baruch Hu chooses sometimes to do bad things to good people. He says that Koheles was written with what he calls the Midas Hadin, with only the overt, apparent machinations of our world, and not dealing with the metaphysics of Olam Haba, the spiritual realm, and the afterlife. He says that the book of Eov is devoted more towards that subject, whereas the book of Koheles is an observational work, meaning that it is based upon a person who was able to experience things throughout his life, and based on purely his observations of the human experience, is able to come to various different conclusions. And that is precisely the reason why Sefer Kohelis is filled with so many contradictions, because the human experience is an experience of contradictions. And therefore, it is not surprising that Sefer Kohelis raises more questions than it ends up answering. And therefore, we have to resort, and that's why, as we know, Chazal had this tremendous dilemma as to whether or not to canonize Sefer Kohelis, that is, to incorporate it into the Sifrei Tanakh. The Gemara says that this was a great debate of the sages of the Mishnah, and they finally agreed to incorporate it as the part of the canon. Why? Because of the very, or the penultimate Pasuk at the, the very end of, uh, of Kohelis, where he says, Sof davar hakol nishma, and so Elohim yira ve'es mitzvah sav shemor kizeh kol ha'adam. That at the end of the day, after everything has, be, has been heard, you, not, you need to fear God and perform his mitzvahs, because that is the totality of man. And the way the Ramban explains it, it's like, is that it's sometimes better not to even contemplate some of the questions that I've raised in this book, uh, because some of these questions seem to have no answer. <coughs> it is better to get them out of your head at some point in your life and just say, okay, I've discussed these questions, I've thought about them, shoingenik, sof davar, that's the end, a kol nishma, and now we get back to the work of the task at hand, which is my purpose in life, es elokim yirav es mitzvah sav shemor kizek ol that's my, that's my purpose. It's nice, it's important to think about these things and to deliberate over these things and to ruminate and to ponder. But at the end of the day, it, and he says, he even gives the analogy, he says it's like a judge's ruling. After the judge has heard all the arguments back and forth between the prosecution and the defense, he bangs down his gavel and he says, this is the ruling. 
And once the ruling is made, the issue is no longer up for discussion. I've issued my ruling. And that's why Kohelis does end so abruptly in this fashion. The final ruling, therefore, is to revere Hashem and to dedicate oneself to those things which will cause Hashem to love you. That's the way the Ramban phrases this last Pasuk, and that is namely the mitzvahs. And he says that this last Pasuk of Sof Davar, at the end of all things, those two words, Sof Davar, are actually an allusion to the fact that we will not realize and get a final solution to all of the, ans to all of the questions that we have been asking until sometime later in the history of mankind. Sof Davar. Even though nothing is arbitrary, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will not necessarily finalize things and equalize things in the here and now. We will have to wait to some point in the far-flung future in order to be able to see the justice that, Baruch, that we know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu will eventually meet, meet out. Therefore, he says, fear Hashem and do those things which will cause Hashem to love you. And the Ramban points to the second of the Ten Commandments, which says that Hashem brings vengeance upon those who worship graven images and idols, but also that our Kodesh Baruch Hu does kindness with thousands of generations after a person has passed through this world, to those who love me, and to those who observe my mitzvot. And so there, from that Pasuk, says the Ramban, you see, that anyone who performs Hashem's mitzvahs automatically becomes a beloved of Hashem. And therefore the goal of life that Shlomo HaMelech is trying to tell us is, do that which will cause Hashem to love you, and therefore you will truly be happy. And this, this last puzzle, which doesn't really talk about Hashem loving us, but rather just says that to do his mitzvahs because that's the totality of man, even, and the Ramban reads in that Pasuk, he says, what that means is, is that Hashem wants you to do those things which will make you the object of His love. And he elaborates on that based upon a very interesting Midrash. This Midrash is found in the Mechilta, uh, in, Parshas, in Parshas Yisrael. And the Mechilta says, what does Leo Havai mean? What is it to those who love me, my beloved one, says Hashem? That refers to Avraham Avinu. And and those who observe my commandments, that refers to the Nevi'im, to the prophets, and to the Zikanim, the elders of every generation. And furthermore, says the Medrash, Le'ohavai u'l'shomrei mitzvosai, refers to, it says, Elu Yisrael shehem yoshvim be'eretz Yisrael, this refers to the Jewish people who dwell in the land of Israel, v'nosnim nafsham al ha'mitzvos, and sacrifice their lives in order to perform mitzvot. And then the Midrash gives some illustrations. Now we realize that both the Midrash, which is composed uh, centuries before the Ramban, but also during the Ramban's lifetime, Eretz Israel is a dangerous place. It's a place where if you go there, there's a strong likelihood that you will not survive the journey to go to Eretz Israel. And there's also a strong likelihood that if you do arrive there, your life will be filled with persecution and in all likelihood an early death. And so therefore it was no simple task to advocate to go to Eretz Yisrael. And that's why the Ramban quotes this Midrash and he says, Why, asks the Midrash to the, to the protagonist of the Midrash, why are you going to be executed? answers the individual, because I circumcised my son. Why are they taking you to be burnt at the stake? Because I was reading from the Torah. Why are you going to be crucified? Because I ate matzah. Why are you being whipped by, a, by a, an, an, an inquisitioner? Al shenatalti is halulav because I shook a lulav, and finally he quotes a pasuk from Zechariah, which illustrates the same thing: that all of the afflictions that Jewish people take upon themselves in this world cause them to be beloved by Hashem um, to, to, the, to their Father in heaven. And so, therefore, for the Ramban, the definition of a beloved one of Hashem is one who does mitzvahs with the expectation and the realization that he will suffer as a result and yet he still does those mitzvahs willingly. Now, 
you can certainly appreciate where the Ramban is going with this. Here he is. He's entered into a disputation with the, with the, with the, with the Catholic Church. He's won, but he knows that there are no winners when it comes to the Church. He knows that this is going to mean certain persecution for him. And even knowing this, he went into it because he felt pressured and he felt that this was, would be to the best interests of the Jewish community. He then published a work in, to disseminate to his fellow Jews, showing them all of the arguments and showing them how he has bested the church in the disputation because he does not want his brethren to fall into the clutches of the church. And he knows what this means. He knows that it's going to mean persecution. He knows that he's going to be either executed or exiled as a result. And so you can just hear the words of the Ramban in his final drasha communicating to his beloved Kehillah and explaining to them, I knew that this was going to happen, but I did it willingly because I know that this is what it means to be a beloved of Hashem. And at this point, the Ramban then says, what, we, what I want us to also focus on in this Mechilta is I want us to focus on the words of the Medrash would say that Elu Yisrael Shehem Yoshvin Be'eretz Yisrael. He says this refers to the Jews who live in the land of Israel and willingly submit themselves for, for persecution and for execution. So the Ramban says, why was it necessary for the Medrash to talk about the land of Israel? Because are there not Jews who are persecuted in all corners of the earth? Why does the Mechilta focus on Jews who live in Eretz Yisrael? And the Ramban explains, he says, Kisham Ikar Shimor Mitzvot. He says, because Eretz Yisrael is the primary place for a Jew to observe Hashem's mitzvahs. And therefore, if you want to be a truly beloved of Hashem, it's not just enough to do the mitzvahs of Hashem amidst persecution. You have to do the mitzvahs of Hashem in Eretz Yisrael amidst persecution. And that's the ultimate way to really garner HaKadosh Baruch Hu's love. Now, the Ramban quotes a bizarre midrash that implies that the only reason for doing mitzvot outside of Eretz Yisrael is in order to not get rusty. There's a midrash, it's in the Sifri in Parshas Re'e, and it says something very unusual and very bizarre in relation to the value of doing a mitzvah outside of Eretz Yisrael. And this is really the springboard for the Ramban to talk about his impending trip to Eretz Yisrael, his impending Aliyah. And the, um, the, the Medrash says as follows, God says to the Jewish people that even though one day I'm going to exile you and send you out of the land of Israel and you'll have to live a life in Golos, heyu mitsuyanim b'mitzvahs, I still want you to distinguish yourselves with the performance of mitzvot so that when that you return to Eretz Yisrael mitzvot performance will not seem like something new and novel because you'll have been doing them for so many centuries in Golos you'll have gotten used to what it means to perform mitzvot and then the Medrash gives this very strange mashal it gives a very strange parable and it says mashal amelech basar vadam this can be compared to a mortal king who once became angry with his wife, and he exiled her to her father's home. He says, we can't live anymore together. I'm sending you back to your father's house. But he said to her, don't let yourself go. <laughs> don't, don't start eating bonbons and I want you to continue wearing your, wearing your makeup, I want you to continue wearing your jewelry, and I want you to continue looking beautiful. And why is that? He says, Because I, we're just, we, we had a fight, but that doesn't mean I'm divorcing you. We need to live apart for a while, but we will reconcile. And when we reconcile, I want you to look beautiful. And therefore, Kach Omar HaKadosh Baruch Hu Yisrael, Hashem says to the Jewish people in the same vein, He says, Bonai heyu mitsuyanim b'mitzvot. I want you to be well trained and distinguished in mitzvah performance even when I send you back out of Eretz Yisrael into the Golos. Shekeshetach zeru lo yu alechem chadashim. So that when you are ready to come back to Eretz Yisrael, 
mitzvah performance will not seem like something strange and novel to you. You'll have been accustomed to it for your entire life. So the Ramban says he has a lot of difficulty with this medrash. Because if you look carefully at the language of the, med of the medrash, it is referring to various mitzvah performances such as the wearing of tefillin, the wearing of tzitzis, the putting up of a mezuzah on your door, and the Midrash implies that the only reason why a, a Jew should have a mezuzah on his door or tefillin on his arm is just to stay in practice and not get rusty. How can you tell me that a personal bodily commandment only is applicable, only applies in Eretz Yisrael? Don't we know that the mitzvahs were given to the Jewish people for all places and all times? But that's not what the Medrash implies. Medrash implies that really we only do it to stay, to stay in practice when we're in Golis because they only count when we're in Eretz Yisrael. So how do you reconcile this, this, says the Ramban? And this is where the Ramban begins his answer to explain the ontological and fundamental and very, very dramatic difference between the land of Israel and every other land out there. And the reason why I use that philosophical uh, terminology of ontological difference is because for the Rambam, for Maimonides, we may not find such a, a drastic and dramatic distinction between Eretz Yisrael and Chutz Laaretz, other than the fact that HaKadosh Baruch Hu said there are certain mitzvahs that we can only perform in Eretz Yisrael. But the Ramban views the difference between Eretz Yisrael and Chutz Laaretz in a much more stark fashion much more in line with Rabbi Yud HaLevi and the Kuzari. And he begins his answer by saying that we can find uh, the same type of attitude between Eretz Yisrael and Chutz Laaretz that we just saw in this Medrash, we can find it also in the Torah itself. At the end of Parshas Acharimos, and we lane it every Yom Kippur, the Torah talks about all of the forbidden things, all of the incestuous relationships and the forbidden encounters that are considered to be an abomination of to, to Hashem. And at the end of that section, the Torah says that you have to make sure that you do not imitate what the Canaanites did before you. Because, Because the land of Eretz Yisrael became defiled through those behaviors, and the land vomited them out, and that is the reason why you are taking over. And if you want to make sure that the land does not vomit you out in the same way that it did to the Canaanites that came before you, you have to make sure not to Im imitate that behavior. Now, that's a very strange thing for the Torah to say. If the Arayos, if the forbidden relationships are Usr, they're Usr whether they're in Eretz Yisrael or whether they're in Chutz Laaretz. So why does the Torah have to say Make sure you don't do these things so the land doesn't spit you out. Well, even if the land spits you out, they're still as, as abominable as they were in Eretz Yisrael. So you see, says the Ramban, that there's a special quality to mitzvah performance, specifically in Eretz Yisrael, that is different and unique and can only be accomplished there. And he, he points out to us something that we probably have heard before over the course of our Jewish <laughs> studies, but it's important to know that this is emphasized greatly by the Ramban, both in his drasha, and later on, he would write this more explicitly in his Torah commentary in a number of different places. And it's based upon a, pasuk, a couple of psukim in Parshas Ha'azinu that say as follows, That when God dispersed all of mankind and he established them all into their different respective nations, That God remained the... Uh, retained his portion of mankind as the Jewish people and living in Eretz Yisrael. And what the Ramban tells us is an important yisod, an important principle, and that is, is that every single nation has its own guardian uh, spiritual force. Every single nation has its own star and constellation in the heavens that has been appointed as, as, an, as an intermediary force to watch over and protect that nation. And every star and constellation has an angel above it. Don't ask me to explain the difference between an angel and a constellation and a star at this point. It's not really, uh, this gets into the, um, the physics and the metaphysics of the Ramban, which we don't really, would not, it would not be that productive for us to dwell on these issues. But suffice it to say that for the Ramban, 
there are intermediary forces, intermediary creations of Hashem, angelic forces, constellational forces that supervise and control and protect every single nation. That is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not have direct <coughs> supervision over all of the other nations of the world. He has direction through his intermediary forces that he put into place. The exception is the Jewish people in Eretz Yisrael. That the Jewish people in Eretz Yisrael do not have any intermediary between themselves and Hashem. And Hashem is the direct supervisor over the Jewish people in Eretz Yisrael. And therefore, we know like it says in the Pasuk, Tamid Enei Hashem that the eyes of the Lord are constantly upon Eretz Yisrael Merishis Hashanah Be'ara Harishana from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. That teaches us that HaKadosh Baruch is directly, uh, it takes a much more direct uh, and uh, concerned uh, inter intervention, interventional role in what's going on in, in Eretz Yisrael. And that's because HaKadosh Baruch Hu chose the Jewish people and part of the definition of our chosenness, which we re read about in Parshas Yisro, where we said, Yisamli segula mikol ha'amim ki li kol you shall be to me a treasure and my, the chosen of all nations, part of that chosenness is that whereas all other, the other nations are consigned to their own sar, their own spiritual force that watches over them, HaKadosh Baruch Hu watches over us directly. That's part of the definition for the Ramban of what it means for the Jewish people to be the chosen people. And because of that, because, like they say, uh, calling God in Eretz Yisrael is a local call, in other words, there's no such thing as an in interventional or in intermediary force, that's the reason why there's less tolerance when there is sinful behavior performed in Eretz Yisrael, because HaKadosh Baruch Hu is right there directly supervising what's going on. That's what the Pasuk means, that the land of Eretz Yisrael cannot tolerate sinful behavior and it will spit out those who do not behave in the way that Hashem wants. And it also explains the Medrash that we started with, which is that it's not that there's no value to performing mitzvahs outside of Eretz Yisrael, but because when you do a mitzvah in Eretz Yisrael, you're doing it directly under the supervision of God directly, therefore the mitzvah has so much more value to the point where comparing mitzvah performance inside Eretz Yisrael versus mitzvah performance outside of Eretz Yisrael, the two qualitatively are completely different. And that's what the Medrash means when it says, when you leave Eretz Yisrael, don't think that you can just say it's, it's over, but rather you still have this yoke of commandments upon you, even though you don't accomplish as much by doing the mitzvah, the mitzvah is still binding upon you. Um, and therefore, it is considered to be the ultimate of blasphemies if we would ever find a person making a comparison between the history of other nations and the history of the Jewish people. The history of other nations is only controlled indirectly by Hashem, where the history of the Jewish people is controlled directly by HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So there's a very interesting episode that appears twice in Tanakh. It is the story about how Sancheriv nearly destroyed the city of Yerushalayim during the reign of King Hezekiah, King Chizkiyahu HaMelech. And during that time, Sancheriv, the king of Assyria, and this is, is recorded in the second book of Kings in the 18th chapter and in the book of Chronicles, second book of Chronicles, the 32nd <coughs> chapter, it says that King uh, Sancheriv, the king of Assyria, sends his general at arms, who's a man named Rav Shakeh, and he sends him to the city of Yerushalayim. And he calls out to the people and he says, why are you resisting our takeover? Don't you know the history of the Assyrians? Don't you realize what powerful people we are? And he says to them, do you really think that it's possible for you and your God to stand up to us? Look at what we have done to all the other nations and consequently look at we have, what we have done. We have defeated the gods of all the other nations. And it's as recorded in Sefer Melachim, it says that the people when they heard this, they rended their garments, they, 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 they tore Kriya. And the reason they tore Kriya was because this was the epitome of blasphemy. To say that the gods, so to speak, gods with a, cat, with a lowercase g, of those other nations, which were put into place by Hashem, those intermediary forces, you can compare that to, the, to the HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself, 
He says, why do you think we call Hashem the Melech Malchei Hamlachim HaKadosh Baruch Hu? We call God the King of Kings. King of Kings is not just an appellation to describe that God rules over mortal kings. King of Kings also means that God is in charge of all of the different forces that control the actions of all of the other nations. We also call God Elokei HaElohim Va'adonai HaAdonim. We call him the God of all gods. We call him the master of all masters. We do that because we're referring to these spiritual forces that reign over all of these other nations. So the people tore Kriya because they felt that this was the ultimate blasphemy against the Melech Malchei Amlachim HaKadosh Baruch Hu. To say that God is on an equal footing with his creations, his intermediary forces that he placed over other nations. And then the Ramban makes a social commentary. Remember, this is a drasha to his community. And he says, and why didn't we tear Kriya? During the recent disputation that was held in, in, in Gerona, when it was suggested that the God of the Jews is on equal footing with the God of the Christians. And he says, that is also why we are guilty. Because back then they had the fortitude, the spiritual strength to tear Kriya when they heard this blasphemy against Hashem, and we did not. And therefore, perhaps that is one of the reasons why I am going into Gullus as a result. Anyway, so the Ramban says, therefore we see that Eretz Yisrael occupies a special status, and that's why the Canaanites were spit out of there, not because they were the only nation engaging in these kinds of incestuous relationships, but because Eretz Yisrael could not tolerate this kind of close affront. And the Ramban then quotes the Gemara in Ksubis, which says, Kol hadar be'chutz anyone who lives outside of Eretz Yisrael, ki'ilu oved avodas kochavim, as if he is an idol worshiper, if he lives outside of Eretz Yisrael. And so, of course, the question is, what does that mean? I'm not an idolater just because I live in Toronto. And the answer is, yes, in a sense, because I am choosing to place this intermediary force between myself and Hashem by living in a country which is not supervised directly by HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And therefore, it is almost like I am choosing idolatry over the, over the real thing. And, uh, um, and that's why Chazal also say that Yeshivas Eretz Yisrael shekula keneged kol ha-mitzvah shebetor that living in Eretz Yisrael is equally weighted to all of the other mitzvahs in the Torah because qualitatively by living in Eretz Yisrael I, my mitzvah performance is completely transformed because of, what I'm, because of the relationship that I have with Hashem. He says it also explains that shortly after Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple, the first temple, there were a number of very uh, vulgar or crass Jews that confronted the prophet Yechezkel in Bavel. And they said to him, it's no longer necessary for us to serve Hashem. They said to him, look, uh, you know, now that we're in Bavel, Hashem can't have any tainus on us if we decide to choose other gods. What was their argument? The argument was, we're no longer under, directly under Hashem's tutelage. And so therefore, what, what point is there for us to do the mitzvahs if Hashem is not with us anymore? And Yechezkel's response to them, and this is in uh, Yechezkel chapter 20, verse 32, he says, V'ha'ole al ruchachem ha'yo lo si'yeh, asher atim omrim ni'yek ha'goyim, k'mishpachos ha'aretzos l'sharei se'etzvah ebe. No, it's not like that. That now that you feel that you're in Golis, you can just do whatever you want. It almost sounds like the Jews after the Shoah, right? In other words, there was this attitude of, of nihilism. Where it does, it's, there's no point to it anymore. We've been exiled. But the Ramban says that it's more than just a sense of giving up, a sense of purposelessness, a sense of giving up. They genuinely believe that since God is not directly supervising our lives in Eretz Yisrael, there's really no point in us do, doing mitzvahs anymore. And Yechezkel says no, that even though the quality of the mitzvahs has been diminished, but there still is value for the individual to continue performing mitzvahs. The Ramban then points out that what do we do with all of those psukim? and Ma'amore Chazal and statements by our sages, which seem to imply that the Jews too have guardian angels. For example, in the, in the book of Daniel, it says that the, uh, the angel Michael, the angel Michael, is the guardian angel over all of the Jewish people. So how do we deal with that? If the Jewish people don't have a guardian angel, they don't have any intermediary force that watches over them, so what is the role of the, of the angel Michael, or the angel Gabriel? or all of the other angels that are described in Jewish angelology. 
So he explains that in Sefer Daniel, when it talks about the angel Michael protecting the Jewish people, it does not mean that he is our intermediary force that watches over us. It simply means that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has assigned certain malachim to daven for us, to pray for us, to look out for our welfare, but that still that doesn't mean that Michael is our intermediary angel that is in charge of the Jewish people. The Ramban also says that I cannot explain this principle any further because there are certain mystical secrets that are contained in this idea of Eretz Yisrael being directly supervised by Hashem and I, I can't, he says, I can't, I can't discuss this sod in a public venue any further. And then the Ramban points out that based upon our discussion that we've had up until now, we can certainly understand the very first commandment that was given to Avraham Avinu of Lech Lecha, of it's time for you to leave. And here the Ramban takes one of his other interludes during this lengthy drasha, and he tries to explain the very first pasuk of Parshas Lech Lecha, where Hashem says, Vayomer Hashem al Avram, Hashem says to Avram, Lech Lecha me'artzecha u'mimoladetecha u'mibes avicha el ha'aretz asher areka. Get thee, Lech Lecha, me'artzecha from your land, from your birthplace, from your father's house, to the land which, and I, I want you to go to the land which I will show you. And the famous question that Rashi asks, that the Ibn Ezra asks, that a number of num, a number of Meforshim ask is, how could you, how could at this point Hashem be telling Abraham to move away from your birthplace, if the Torah had already re revealed to us at the end of Parshas Noah that Abraham had already left with Terach and the rest of his family, they had left Ur Kasdim. And they had already departed his birthplace, which was Ur Kasdim, and they ended up in Haran. And in Haran, is, which is where our story in Parshas Lech Lecha begins, Hashem says to Avram, Lech Lecha me'artzecha mimoladet lecha mibes avicha. So Rashi is bothered, very bothered with this problem. Uh, Avram has already left his birthplace, so how can God say, get thee from thy birthplace? Rashi says that really what Hashem was telling Avram was, move further away from your birthplace. You've already started to leave. Now continue on your journey and move even further away from your birthplace. It's very difficult, says the Ramban. And the Ramban therefore concludes, after a lengthy discussion, which I won't go into now, he concludes that in reality, Avraham was born in Haran, not in Ur Kasdim. Even though the Torah tells us that Avraham was living in Ur Kasdim, he says Ur Kasdim is very, very far. That is not even a Shemite, a Semite land. Ur Kasdim is a place which was inhabited by the uh, descendants of Ham. It was, it's all the way, according to archaeologists and biblical scholars, uh, the, the land of Ur is all the way in southern Iraq, very, very far east of the Middle Eastern region which we're talking about, where Haran is further north. It's all the way up by southern Turkey, but it's definitely f much further west, certain, the same longitudinal lines as Eretz Yisrael. So what happened was, is that Avraham had been exiled, from, he had been living in Haran, he grew up there, was exiled from Haran because he started to show signs of monotheism, which was a threat to the kingdom in Haran. And he was exiled and he went to Ur Kasdim. And something stirred within him and he and his father and other members of his family decided to travel all the way west to move even further away from Haran, but they would have to pass through Haran in order to make their trek. So the Ramban says that Avram went back to Haran temporarily his brother Nahor ended up living there for the rest of his life. But at that point, when Avram was really planning to move further west into Europe, HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells him, Lech Lecha, now leave your birthplace of Haran and now go south to Eretz Yisrael, to the land which I will show you. That's the way the Rabban understands the whole passage. Now, of course, this has nothing. We've gone far afield from the Sefer Kohelis at this point. This discussion has absolutely nothing to do with Shlomo HaMelech's book of Kohelis. So why is the Ramban bringing it up here? And here again, this is very revelatory about the Ramban's personal experience. Remember I told you the very first uh, discussion we had, the very first session, when we talked about the biography of the Ramban. His life was unique when you think about it. He led a relatively peaceful life. He was born in Gerona. He became the chief rabbi of Gerona, right? Even though, you know, the famous saying, Eina Bibiro, there's no prophet in his hometown. He was a homegrown boy, the Ramban. 
He was born in Gerona, he became the chief rabbi of Gerona, and eventually became the chief rabbi of all of Catalonia, and here he is giving his farewell to the place that he was born, and now he's got to go Lech Lecha, now he's got to leave. And so we can just hear the, the tremendous sadness that the Ramban is, is experiencing, saying farewell to the place where he's grown up his entire life. He's now a man, he's old, close to 70 years old, and he has to spend the last few years in exile in Eretz Yisrael. And he's trying to explain to his kehila that he's not sad about this. He's not upset. He realizes that this is what Hashem wants. He realizes that this is the final chapter of his life where he becomes a beloved of Hashem, where it is now his turn to be able to demonstrate how he's going to uh, ratchet up his mitzvah performance and be able to fulfill the very, very purpose for which he was created. So that's really where we are. And he says, based upon the legacy of Avram Avinu, there were two things that became the legacy of Avram Avinu. One legacy of Avram Avinu was Yishuv Eretz Yisrael, and the other legacy of Avram Avinu was the mitzvah of tzedakah. And that is what the Ramban ends his drasha with, with a long discussion of the mitzvah of tzedakah and why it is so important for the Jewish people. And that we're going to leave for our last session, Mirz Hashem, next week, a week from tonight. We'll talk about the very last few pages of the Ramban's drasha and Sefer Kohelis. And we'll come back to Sof Davar HaKol Nishma at the very end as well. Any uh, questions before we break up, Stan? Last week we ended with Eo and started with Kilgo Nishma tonight, but you said that was this week, so what a word we come up with Mida, Kenegad Mida, as far as well, I mentioned, you know, very, the Ramban only alludes to the whole concept of reincarnation of Gilgul Nishamot, and then he goes on. So I decided just to go on all the stuff. <laughs> but uh, the truth is, is the Ramban basically, I started off by saying, is that the Ramban says Sefer Koelis does not deal with these really transcendent metaphysical ideas that are really what we call Sisrei Torah, the secrets of the Torah, because that's not what Koelis thematically is about. And that's why the Ramban only just alludes to them in his drasha. But we do find other places in his Torah commentary and his commentary to Sefer Eov where he does touch on these things a little bit more. But even when he, even when he talks about them in his Torah commentary, he's very, very vague. Very vague. Yeah? Will you be talking about how we answer Bible critics to say that Sotavar is just an addition? No, I will not be discussing that because we have no indication that it is. We have no indication that it is, and the Ramban certainly did not subscribe to that. The Ramban felt that thematically, it fits perfectly with what this mm -hmm. message that Shlomo Melech is trying to communicate. That part of the part of the struggle of life is living with the questions and then moving on, going weiter. You got to go weiter. Yeah. Um, and this should be the last one. Yeah. Two uh, things disturb me, and, uh, and I think they're related. Is that why does some um, why does Kalala say to fear God, not to love God? And similarly, the idea of suffering for Judaism, isn't it, for, for doing mitzvahs, isn't that kind of like Christian type of idea? Um, isn't it that, that we're supposed to feel it, it's supposed to help our lives, that we don't suffer, it, it's not really suffering to keep the mitzvahs? No, no that's, 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 a, that's a perfectly legitimate question. And the answer to that question is, that when a Jew lives a life of suffering and he wishes to make sense of it, then he embraces the suffering as a gift from Hashem. When you live a life of happiness and you want to make sense of that, so then you make sense of the happiness by saying that Hashem wants us to be happy. So, you know, that's the Ramban. The Ramban is talking about the most tragic chapter of his life which is going into exile now as a 70-year-old man. So it makes sense for him to be discussing this in terms of fearing God and not loving God. You notice that he doesn't say that the goal of life is to love God. The, fear, the, the goal of life is to fear God and to be beloved by God. Whether or not I'm going to end up loving Hashem, that's really not the issue, he says. I'm supposed to revere Hashem amidst all of the suffering, and I'm supposed to do that which will make me beloved to Hashem. Um, this goes back actually to the first four weeks <clears throat> because all the way through it's been bothering me. I've always found Kahala very comforting. <laughs> it hasn't bothered me at all. What has bothered me though is, is the translation. Is there any better translation besides futility, which means pointlessness, uselessness, 
vanity, which is something, you know, the bonfire of the vanities. Something really uh, disgusting almost. Frivolous. Yeah. Could it possibly be translated as a fleeting, evanescent, not permanent, impermanence? Well, if you, if you notice, that was one of the ways that the Ramban had explained yeah. it, that he had said that the words Havel Havalim is a commandment. Make that which is fleeting truly fleeting in your own mind. Make it unimportant. Make it transitory. Make it something that you know is not worth dwelling upon simply because it is fleeting. It, the, the Ramban's point of what Hevel is, he says it's like the breath that is exhaled from, from, from the mouth, which is what the word Hevel means. It's breath. It dissipates quickly and it, it's gone. And as a result, it's vanity. As a result, if a person makes that the priority of his life, then he's wasting a life. That's the, that's, that's the whole point. Okay? We've got to go. Please go to your next session and have a good evening.